lengua. When I think about tongue meat, which admittedly isn't very often, I think about lengua tacos from Mexico. But if you go back to the 19th century, you'll see that every single European style fancy restaurant here in the United States back then, they all had tongue meat on the menu. City Hotel, Chicago, 1847, boiled tongue. They don't specify from what animal. They get a lot more specific at the Louisville Hotel in Kentucky, 1866. You got your fresh beef tongue served hot with tomato sauce, cold beef tongue ornamented with what, I wonder, or cold lamb's tongue in form of jelly. How about hot sheep's tongue a la tatar? Doesn't that mean raw? How can it be both raw and hot? Smoked tongue was apparently quite popular in the 19th century. And look at this one, Palmer House, Chicago, 1875, smoked buffalo tongue. This makes a lot of sense, especially in Chicago. Right around this time in the 1870s, the buffalo were being hunted to the brink of extinction in the great American interior. Hunters often wouldn't bother to even recover the entire carcass. They'd just harvest the furs for leather, and I suppose maybe they'd harvest the tongues for meat. Tongue is an easy piece of meat to harvest. The tongue tale is just one of many fascinating things I've learned by flipping through this excellent book. Menu Design in America, A Visual and Culinary History of Graphic Styles and Design, 1850 to 1985. You should buy it if you can find it. Great book. I just really want to show you some interesting things I've learned here about menus from the 19th and early 20th centuries specifically. Quick note, uh, these menus naturally reflect the social attitudes of their day, and so there's lots of highly objectionable stuff in here. We'll talk more about that later. Another meat dish you'll see on every fancy menu from the 19th century, boiled mutton with caper sauce. There it is in Boston in 1852, St. Louis in 1863, San Francisco in 1869, oh, also more buffalo tongue, Cincinnati in 1870, boiled mutton with caper sauce. Seriously, every upscale American menu from the 19th century had this dish on it, which is weird because mutton is virtually unheard of in this country these days. I mean, we eat a little bit of lamb, but the adult animal, mutton, is much stronger and tougher, which is probably why they boiled it until soft. Maybe boiled meant simmered in this context? And hey, what is caper sauce? Well, I found a couple of 19th century recipes for it. It's basically roux with some stock and some white wine, lemon juice, spices, shallots, capers. It's a sour gravy, a piquant sour gravy. Would have been nice for kind of freshening up the funky smell of the mutton. Another bygone meat on nearly every fancy 19th century menu from the US is boiled head, usually calves head. There's lots of tasty meat in animal heads, notably in the cheeks, and they would simmer the whole head until it was soft, and maybe they would debone it for the customers, maybe they wouldn't. Tete de veau, they were calling it in France, often served with vinaigrette or en tortue, which meant in the style of a turtle. Speaking of turtles, another dish on every 19th century American menu was turtle soup. Green turtle here in Boston, turtle a la Maryland in Louisville. They harvested terrapin turtles in Maryland from the Chesapeake Bay. Terrapin soup there on the Royal Blue Line, a railroad dining car menu. Trains used to have real fancy food. And the coastal United States used to have a lot of turtles to eat until they ate too many of them and uh, yeah. Another thing I like on this 1891 railroad menu, Hygieo water used on table. Hygieia was a famous spring in Wisconsin named after the Greek goddess of hygiene. 1883 dining car menu from the Pennsylvania lines. Table water from the Silurian Springs in Waukesha, Wisconsin. 1903 Los Angeles Shasta water from the springs near Mount Shasta, California. Fancy single origin spring water was a big health craze in the United States in the 19th century. People would come from all over to particular springs with reputed health benefits. Sick people would travel there and resort towns would spring up around the springs. Sick people would go there and take the water. So they would drink it, bathe in it. One such spring water resort was in French Lick, Indiana. And we see an interesting note on this 1920 menu from the hotel there. Guests using the waters should avoid uncooked fruits and raw vegetables. I think guests using the water would have been code for sick people. But speaking of beverages, every one of these menus ends with coffee, often listed as demitasse, as on this 1913 menu from New York. Here it is, 1911, San Francisco. It doesn't even say coffee, it just says demitasse. Demitasse just means half cup in French. 
In the 19th and early 20th century, there was apparently a very strong tradition of ending the meal, ending dinner specifically, with a teeny tiny cup of very, very strong black coffee. The demitasse was a little shot of strong coffee to get you through what remained of your evening. That tradition may have faded somewhat here in the US, but at least now we have Trade Coffee, the sponsor of this video. Here, let's brew a demitasse of super strong Café Noir. I love coffee, but I don't really have the time or the inclination to seek out really good coffees, which is why my trade experience has been so much fun. Trade has a team of tasters who find and sample thousands of coffees from independent roasters all over the place. You take their quiz online, you tell them what you like in your coffee, and then they start sending you stuff that you're going to love. Cancel or skip shipments anytime. Trade knows that I really like bright, acidic coffee, so they send me lots of natural processed beans, beans that have been dried inside their fruits. And yeah, that works at double strength. The red bags are compostable, by the way. You can literally bury them in your yard. Right now, Trade is offering my viewers a total of $30 off your first order, plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash ragusia, or click the link in the description below. This offer won't last forever, so be sure to take advantage while you still can. Get started by taking the simple quiz at drinktrade.com slash ragusia, and let Trade find you a coffee that you're going to love. Use my link and they'll know that I sent you to save $30. Thank you, Trade. Anyway, lots of weird old dishes were ubiquitous across 19th century menus in America. In contrast, I'm going to show you some uh, dishes that are kind of weird and uh, don't seem to be ubiquitous. I only see them mentioned once in this book. 1884 hotel menu from Kansas City. Pineapple fritters with lemon sauce. Would you like some acid with your acid? 1870 Christmas dinner menu from a hotel banquet in Cincinnati. Timbale of macaroni a la chasseur. A la chasseur means hunter's style, and this makes me envision someone hunting macaroni, and I think that's pretty funny. 1849 menu from Irving House, a hotel in New York City. You've seen head on the menu, but how about calves head with brain sauce? There's a whole head theme going on there. I suppose brain has a lot of fat in it, plus it has lecithin, an emulsifier, so maybe brain kind of functions like egg yolk in sauce? Oh, also on this menu, a note. Each waiter is provided with wine cards and a pencil. A wine card just means wine list. But why do we need to assure the diners that the waiter has a pencil? Is this to assure them that the waiter is going to get their order right and remember it? I don't know. If you know, let me know. An 1866 banquet in Louisville, Kentucky, fetting newly inaugurated U.S. President Andrew Johnson. An incredibly elaborate and lavish menu featuring ham in champagne sauce? You'll love ham and bubbly. And among the cold relishes, we see oyster cat soup, or ketchup as it is spelled these days. This one actually isn't as weird as it sounds. Historically, ketchup was an English word for a sour and savory sauce from Southeast Asia that was made with fermented fish or with fermented bean paste, something that would provide some really, really strong umami. Eventually, people started getting that umami from highly reduced tomato sauce, and now you have ketchup. But speaking of oysters, extremely fancy 19th century American restaurants all made a big point of serving fresh oysters, no matter how far inland they were. Like Louisville is 600 miles from the Atlantic, raw oysters in Kansas City, a thousand miles from the ocean, eastern oysters in San Francisco, 3,000 miles from the Atlantic. Why were they serving eastern oysters when they had Pacific oysters like right there? It was kind of a flex to demonstrate your ability to get precious things from far away and to get them there unspoiled. Plus, this is a period when white Americans were spreading westward, away from the Atlantic coast with all of its lobsters and oysters, and these people still craved those foods. Oysters were said to be served at the first Thanksgiving in Massachusetts. This might explain why the Maui Hotel in Hawaii imported eastern oysters from 6,000 miles away for their Thanksgiving dinner of 1912. Now, this is a dining car menu from 1864. Lobsters and oysters were actually easier to keep fresh than other seafood because you could transport them alive. Oh, by the way, notice the all-black waiters serving all-white customers. Lots of casual racism in these menus. White diners of the 19th and early 20th centuries likely would have associated black faces with either agriculture or domestic servitude. The Great Migration hadn't happened yet, so nearly all black Americans lived in the South doing farm labor. Black faces would have evoked the origin of the food being served, 
or the servitude of the person bringing it to the table, and by extension, the supremacy of the person being served. So that's the white supremacy in these menus. Now let's talk about the sexism. Keep in mind that a lot of these fancy restaurants, especially in the 19th century, they would not have served women at all, or if they did serve women, it would be only as a guest of a man. The male appetite reflected in these menus is textbook Madonna whore dichotomy. Women are either depicted as matronly, the selfless providers of nourishment and comfort, or they are depicted as objects of desire to be consumed. Is the woman a metaphor for the drink, or is the drink a metaphor for the woman? I suppose the dichotomy is uh, reconciled in this 1935 menu from a casino in Chicago, a woman lactating champagne into the glasses of tiny men worshipping at her feet. All right, I'm going to show you another sexist illustration from one of these old menus, and this one crosses the line into explicit violence. So I'm going to actually blur part of it out just because I don't want that trash on my channel, but I think it's an important one for us to look at because it really, really explicitly communicates the male attitude behind these illustrations. The chefs, I believe, are satyrs, the male nature spirits from Greek mythology. They represent man's animal desires, and they appear to be stringing up a woman with actual rope or string to prepare her as meat. This is from a menu from a private dining club in San Francisco that still exists today. It's called the French Club. I imagine they've progressed in a hundred years. Less disturbing, but no less bizarre, is this 1933 Art Deco menu. The women's upper and lower lips are way too far apart. And what happened to this woman? I mean, what even is that? Is that a face? Oh, and Asian people are also depicted quite objectionably in these menus, no surprise. Not many Asians to be found, though, in this early Chinese-American restaurant menu, New York, 1922. Here's one from the same year from Los Angeles. Chop suey, egg foo young, dishes for a mostly white clientele invented by a wave of Chinese immigrants who came to California to labor on the railroads. Right act is strictly enforced here. What does that mean? I figured this one out too. The Right Act was the state-level prohibition law in California. Federal law had made alcohol illegal all across the United States in 1920, a couple of years before this menu, but states then proceeded to pass their own state-level versions of prohibition to help with enforcement on their local territory. California was actually kind of late to do this because, uh, well, the, the vineyard owners in California weren't exactly excited about prohibition. California is also a place where we see the emergence of Mexican-American cuisine, still referred to as Spanish food in this 1912 menu from a tourist spot in the San Fernando Valley. There are directions from LA reflecting that the valley would have been a pretty remote location back then. Here's one from LA a few years later, 1935. At least they call them Spanish-Mexican dishes. And hey, they do takeout. A Mexican takeout place in LA. Things are starting to feel pretty modern. Next time we open this book, I'm going to show you some menus from the mid-century, when restaurants turn to mass production. I'd gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today, extruded from this not-at-all-sinister-looking machine.